In this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about the people of Oceania. Um, so the early inhabitants of the area migrated about 40,000 years ago from Southeast Asia, um, coming over to Australia and eventually to the nearby islands. So you can think of this uh, spreading out of people as occurring eventually, um, you know, often much later, reaching some of those far um, isolated South Pacific islands. And this is a map that shows uh, the former landmass that existed and at the point where sea levels were low on Earth there was um, an area where it was easier for folks to get across between the two um, land masses. We can think of the original inhabitants of uh, these places as First Nations people. It's important to um, not think of these places as um, uninhabited before European occupation. Um, there was a tremendous uh, variety of uh, cultures and communities across the area. And in Australia, you have um, what's been termed uh, the Aboriginal peoples there. They had a variety of languages, cultures, and beliefs. They were a hunter-gatherer-based society. Their um, religion was based on this notion of uh, dream time, as a time of creation where the gods created the landscapes that you see, um, the people there, the animals there, those sorts of things. One of the things that's interesting about uh, their cosmology is that they use a thing called song lines. It's kind of long stories and within those stories, they provide maps of the landscape. So these would be stories that would be told over the course of a couple of days travel, which would help you look for different parts of the train that you needed to have um, and resources for navigation. So kind of an interesting way of uh, thinking about maps and space. In New Zealand, the First Nations peoples were the Maori. They had a Poly uh, Polynesian ethnicity and were very much a warrior-based culture. Um, you can see in some of the images here um, Maori uh, warriors that have uh, the traditional face tattoos uh, pictured there. They had um, an orientation towards uh, the sea and had developed very advanced um, canoes and things like war canoes. European contact with the area began with the mid-1700s. The Spanish and Portuguese, later followed by the Dutch, um, just kind of uh, mapping their way through the area. There wasn't um, necessarily a lot of resources that they were particularly interested in, um, but more just making contact. Um, you can see the maps of some of these voyages here along the coast of Australia and then eventually further out into the Pacific. Later, Australia was colonized by the British who started to build settlement th settlements there in the 1800s. Basically, they used the island as a place to send uh, convicts as forced labor. Um, some of the big crops that they um, were interested in uh, using the island for um, was wool, so they imported uh, sheep, and by the 1860s they were exporting 35 million pounds of wool to Britain. We can think about this in the context of, again, the Industrial Revolution in Europe and uh, that same sort of system that we've seen throughout the world, uh, setting up resources to um, go back uh, to Europe to be processed industrially. We have um, wheat production also expanded through the area, but again, it's important to remember the physical geography here, um, where you can see um, on this map the places of wheat production, the places of um, sheep, things like that, are really um, mostly focused along the coasts where the environments aren't quite as harsh. In the late 1800s, there was a gold rush that drew people more into the interior of the continent. And you can see um, the uh, crossed uh, picks here indicating different mines for things like gold, copper, silver, lead, uh, things like that. So this helped uh, to, again, pull people into the interior of the continent and um, 
fill out the area with uh, roads, railroads, things like that. In New Zealand, you have initial uh, settlements of sealing stations or, or stations where um, people were harvesting um, seals for uh, things like pelts and oil. Um, in the 1840s, there was a treaty developed with the Maori. The Maori um, you know, violently opposed um, uh, colonization, but eventually a, a treaty was developed and settlement began by Europeans on the island. Um, later, there was a discovery of gold and other minerals, which drew more people. And one of the things that's really enabled a lot of um, economic growth and incorporation into world trade for folks in this region is the development of refrigeration. So they were able to export uh, perishable goods like meat and dairy products to other parts of the world. The Pacific Islands really weren't of much interest to Europeans since there wasn't a lot of um, resources there that they were interested in. Um, so through the late 1700s into the early 1900s, you had um, contact by European traders and especially missionaries trying to convert um, folks to Christianity. Yet you can see that these islands have still been uh, split up by a lot of different European um, colonial powers and, and um, other powers. We see uh, Japan and the United States as having interests here as well. So some of these places um, are essentially uh, still colonies and their points of contention for some of these areas who want to um, be free of that. Uh, you see also, um, not on here, but it's important to think about Hawaii as well as probably having more in common with the Pacific Islands than with the mainland United States. And in a lot of senses, ha um, Hawaii was in an, its own uh, nation that had its own uh, monarchy and government was recognized around the world and had um, folks at embassies around the world until the U.S. Um, basically uh, took over Hawaii for the interests of uh, the fruit companies that were uh, existing there. So in some senses we can think of that uh, Hawaii is having more in common with the South Pacific in that sense than the United States. With European contact, uh, there was also the importation of a lot of animals that were exotic to this part of the world. We talked about how there was sort of different evolution of plants and animals um, between Eurasia and um, Australia and Oceania. And when Europeans came, they brought with them their domesticated animals, things like horses, cattle, sheep, goats, pigs, and camels. And with that, these animals were often able to um, outcompete the local species and they didn't have a lot of predators that had necessarily developed along with them. So people have used the term ecological imperialism to see how um, this in, uh, introduction of new species also uh, sort of takes over in certain areas. So one of the big stories from this was in the 18, uh, late 1850s, the European rabbit was introduced and really had a tremendously detrimental effect. Um, obviously, rabbits reproduce quickly, they spread across, and this is in Australia, destroyed a lot of pasture land, um, they put up things like rabbit-proof fences to try to contain uh, the animals uh, and to, try to hunt them and try to wipe them out. So that's just one example of uh, problems with these exotic species. So in the 1900s, you begin to see Australia and New Zealand um, become independent and self-governing colonies, still with a lot of links in terms of economy and society to um, Britain. Um, both countries fought with the Allies in World War II, and um, with the Cold War, they were important places uh, for um, sort of presence of uh, people that were allied with the United States and the West in conflicts related to Southeast Asia, such as Vietnam. And we see increased importance today as more emphasis of the whole world stage is turning to um, East Asia. After World War II and independence through much of the region it was a really sort of important turning point for the area. Um, we can think about how the um, Pacific 
part of the conflict was really uh, fought out in some parts of this region, especially the Pacific Islands. So a lot of places incurred a lot of damage from bombing and occupation uh, as the battles went on between the Japanese and the United States. This also brought in interaction with the United States that hadn't really um, existed before in the region. The U.S. developed a lot of strategic naval bases throughout the region, and there's also uh, payments that the United States made to uh, some of these Pacific islands as payment for having um, the naval bases and things like that there. So that really uh, increased some of the wealth coming into these countries. So in the post-World War II era, you have um, you know, the develop of, development of nuclear weapons, and since these areas are relatively isolated and had low population densities, they were often used for testing of nuclear weapons. Um, so in the Marshall Islands, the U.S. Uh, tested bombs uh, up until 1958, Great Britain tested in Western Australia, um, France te uh, tested in French Polynesia, um, and so you can imagine the sort of um, ongoing environmental issues that might exist in places where they have detonated uh, nuclear weapons. Uranium was also important in terms of resource uh, for the, the area as there's mines for uranium in Australia as well. An interesting example is a place called Bikini Atoll. This was a site of 23 U.S. atomic bomb tests from the late 40s and through the 50s. Um, they had to basically move out the populations that lived there, um, tens of thousands of people that lived on the atoll. They positioned naval ships around the island and would drop bombs and basically see you know, what the aftermath was, how did it affect ships, things like that. So at this point, the island is um, still environmentally damaged from it. It looks you know, beautiful, but you have ongoing uh, radiation, so folks can't um, eat the fruits and vegetables that grow there, um, there's contamination in the soil, um, and this level of radiation that's unsafe for folks to uh, live in for a long period of time. However, they've started to develop it as a tourist destination for scuba divers who are only there for a short period of time. So they can uh, dive wrecks, there's a lot of sunken military ships around the area, um, and so it's a really, I guess, very beautiful place um, to dive in this kind of environment. With the economies in this area, um, in Australia and New Zealand, there was a lot of economic changes in the 1970s that really increased foreign investment, particularly by um, the Japanese. Uh, there was change in how the European Union handles trade, so rather than having these continued trade relations with old colonial powers, there was a realignment from uh, Britain towards the Asian markets. There's also been a rise in some of the service industries here, things like finance, tourism, and business, and um, higher incomes, and relatively high incomes in these two countries overall. The Pacific Islands have uh, economies that folks have classified as MIRAP economies, so based on things like migration, so people moving off the island, um, and sending, getting work elsewhere, sending back money to folks that are still on the island, so sending back remittances. Also aid, um, especially from places like the U.S. who have, uh, if they have military bases, things like that in the area, and uh, you know, bureaucracy. So here's some examples of some of the economies in the region. So in Fiji, you have sugar production that was brought in um, through uh, colonial interaction with the British. So you have uh, sugar and tourism, uh, about 300,000 tourists a year. In Samoa, you have coconut products and tourism. In Tuvalu, you have global communications. They own the .tv uh, URL, um, and so they sell that to places. But often there's a lot of trade deficits because islands obviously can't produce um, everything that they need, so they need to trade with other countries to be able to bring those goods in, which often results in a larger trade deficit. Just to give you a sense of migration overall, this map shows um, places that have folks migrating out in the lightest colors and folks coming in in the darkest colors. So you can see a lot of folks going into Australia, but a lot of folks leaving the Pacific Islands, um, often going to places like Australia, Hawaii, where there's more possibilities for work. And here we see some examples of uh, typical GDPs. So 10, 000, about 10,000 a year in the Cook Islands, about 5,000 in Fiji, um, and uh, lower as you go down the line. So relatively um, low income. 
And though you do see high incomes in places like Australia and New Zealand, there's really high poverty rates among the Aboriginal peoples there. And finally, what Australian families?